There's an ongoing debate that a high percentage of black people in America are unaware that their ancestors did not come from Africa on slave ships, but were in fact prisoners of war and the true Indians that were described by early explorers. One of the greatest military tactics against the people is to strip them of their identity or who they are. A lost people have nothing to fight for except for self-preservation and family. We already know how they broke up the black family. Do you really believe the conqueror would tell you the whole story about you? Not when he's trying to steal your land, your resources, and exterminate you before you find out the truth. A lost people will have the burning desire to find out who they are and where they came from. They will attach themselves to anything that they feel a spiritual connection and pride to without verifying the facts. That includes me. I'm not only making this video for those people, I'm making it for myself. I want to know the truth too. Over time, we as people was forced, combined with intensive brainwashing, to join the brutal oppressor and fight for his cause, giving to us the oppressor's image of God that operates on fear. Love me or go to hell. All the while, they worship the black image of God. We've been placed under a spell that still affects us to this very day. This spell that's been placed on us is what's keeping white supremacy intact. It's a known fact that most black people don't like to read outside of school, and for that they remain ignorant and remain under the same spell. But they're waking up, and they know this, which is why they're trying to start a race war before too many people wake up. This spell is so strong that we allow invaders to come into the country and label us to where they see fit. We went from Negro to colored, to Afro-American, to black, or vice versa, then to African-American. Well, Messy Jesse Jackson should be credited for the African-American label. He took it on his own to speak for all of us to call ourselves African-American in 1988. But did you know the term was first used in 1782? Once. By one person. Who probably was a child born in America to at least one African parent. Don't let this pamphlet justify who you are. The goal is to keep us confused and further separates us from who we truly are. Did you know by claiming any one of those names, including black, in the government's eye sees you not as a nation because there is no nation called African America or black, but as property of the United States government since you are a nationless people. A nationless people falls under the rules of war under Corporation United States. To further confuse and separate us, they give us roots. Why you think the census is so important? I haven't filled out the census the last time. This time they sent tons of census mail to my house. They even came to the door twice. The last guy was knocking on the door like he was the police. Fuck wrong with him. I wanted to answer that door bad to see what his problem was. But in these times, if I don't know you or you don't have an appointment, I'm not opening the door, even if you're looking at me watching TV through the window. Besides, they know who lives in the house. We pay taxes. To me, the census is an inventory of all people and a setup for black people to admit in their own writing that they are a war property of the United States, not for the increased funding like they say. They know who lives where. Have you taken a close look at the census? Look at this shit. What is person one's race? For white print, for example, German, Irish, English, Italian, Lebanese, Egyptian, etc. Egyptians are now considered white. Remember when they used to be black? What's missing for white, European American, and or white American? They letting them know that they can't claim the land freely either, meaning exemption of paying taxes, because their land of origin is overseas. Let's look at black, which is obviously the same as African American. And first on the list, oh look at there, African American. A little redundancy. And the only one on the list that's not a nation. Why is that even there? It's a setup to get you to admit that you're not from America. This video would crack some of those spells. I did most of the work. It's on you to do your own research. Research my research. So to what reason do I believe that the American Indians are the original black people that became the slaves we believe came from Africa? Would you believe the link to your identity lies in the simple tobacco plant? It was in front of our faces the whole time buried in books. The internet is a wonderful thing. You ever watch those old western movies and in front of the general store you see this wooden Indian holding a bundle of cigars and wonder what's that all about? Well, today you're about to find out. But first, I must give you the history of tobacco. Tobacco use has been documented for over 8,000 years. Tobacco cultivation likely began in 5,000 BC with the development of maize-based agriculture in central Mexico. Radiocarbon methods have established the remains of cultivated and wild tobacco in High Rose Cave in New Mexico from 1400 to 1000 BC. It was originally used by Native Americans in religious ceremonies and for medical purposes. Early in tobacco's history, it was used as a cure-all remedy for dressing wounds, reducing pains, and even for toothaches. In the late 15th century, Christopher Columbus was given tobacco as a gift from the Native Americans. I repeat, Christopher Columbus was given tobacco as a gift from the Native Americans. I want you to remember that part. It gained instant popularity in Europe, for they believed that tobacco had magical healing powers. 
Soon, the smoking of tobacco was promoted as a viable way to get your daily dose of tobacco. By the early 17th century, scientists and philosophers were discovering the consequences that smoking tobacco had on their lives, including difficulty with breathing and trouble with quitting. In 1632, Massachusetts passed a state law making smoking in public illegal. This was the earliest legislation recorded regarding smoking. Hernan Cortez and a small group of Spanish soldiers conquered Mexico in 1521, just two years after they landed near the modern day city of Veracruz. The swift conquest of Mexico was made possible by the armies of the native Mexicans, enemy of the Aztec that Cortez enlisted as his allies. From the reports Cortez sent back to King Charles V of Spain, European audience were astonished to learn the existence of rich American empires such as that of the Aztec. The existence of rich American empires. Beginning shortly after the fall of Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, yeah that's how it's pronounced, I had to look it up, and continuing through three centuries of Spanish rule. Now we understand why everybody speaks Spanish. The story of the conquest was illustrated with images of Cortes, Montezuma II, important battles, temples, and the Mexican landscape. The resulting visual records were primarily intended for people who would never travel to Mexico. Conversely, the first Mexican images of the Spanish were created for Montezuma II prior to the arrival of the Spanish in Tenochtitlan. That was tough. That last sentence was filled with a lot of stumbling blocks. Skipping the next paragraph, since the Spanish did not make any portraits of Montezuma II during his lifetime, he is depicted according to the European conception of Native Americans, dressed in a feather skirt and headdress. European conception of Native Americans, dressed in a feather skirt and headdress. Now keep in mind the uniform, this is very important later. Now look at their features. Who they look like to you? The same copper colored Native American Christopher Columbus got his tobacco from. During the 1400s to the 1600s, tobacco was crop king. Now this is before American slavery. Who do you suppose grew and harvest tobacco to trade with other countries? Even other countries knows who the people of America were, and here we don't. They using the same tactics to erase you us from history. Here's where history starts to get stranger than what we were taught. Published 1717. Take a close look at this picture. The trade that the Indians of Mexico do with the French at the port of Mississippi. What do you see? I really wish I could hear your answers. What I see appears to be a marketplace. This is how they always did business. Look at this guy like he's taking inventory. So that means he can read. He's not the only one. Look at these two. They look like they're having a dispute or maybe even negotiating over something. The nerve of that savage Indian pretending to read. These guys over here having a good old conversation. And look at these two in the back, getting it in. They so happy, they kissing. Finally, we could be ourselves. Whoa, 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 I love you, we. And look at this bullshit. You see the finesse happening, right? Remember, peep the uniform.
every stick and stone and every face is white. And since you have not yet seen a mirror, you suppose that you are too. It comes as a great shock around the age of five or six or seven to discover the flag to which you have pledged allegiance <laughs> along with everybody else has not pledged allegiance to you. It comes as a great shock to discover that Gary Cooper killing off the Indians when you were rooting for Gary Cooper, that the Indians were you. It comes as a great shock to discover that the country, which is your birthplace and to which you owe your life and your identity, has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. <laughs> But history gets stranger the closer we are to the end. This was supposed to be a simple video about discrepancies in the American Indian history that kind of got out of hand. It was like opening Pandora's box with all the information tied to this subject which we will go into in part two. John Ogilby, a Scottish translator, published the book in 1671, Ogilby America, which is now listed at $55,000 as being the latest and most accurate description of the new world, containing the original of the inhabitants. This illustration is very important. It appears to be an American black queen being carried by white men that may or may not have been slaves. Don't forget, there were white slaves too. And this was after Columbus. In fact, my opinion, Columbus may have hustled both the King of Spain and Portugal because I think he knew about the trades before they granted him permission to sail. Look, she's holding a cornucopia in one hand, which represents abundance. And she's tossing out what appears to be gold or some type of wealth with the other. You have over here the Spaniards mixed in with what appears to be black Indians. We're gonna come back to this picture again later. Let's go forward to 1607, where the first Englishmen arrived. According to History.com, the Jamestown colony was immediately plagued by disease, famine, and violent encounters with the native population. Speaking of disease, of all the research I've done, none said anything about Indians being wiped out by smallpox. A couple of articles mentioned disease, but that was about it. No name, and the ones that were affected were the new settlers because they may have been drinking bad water. Now, I don't think History.com is 100% accurate on some things. I'm only repeating what I read in other articles as well. In fact, this video may seem like I'm cherry picking stories. That's because I have to. When I separate the lies we've been taught for the new information I'm just finding out, it turns out to be full versions of two very different history blended unnoticed in the same story because too much emphasis was put on the lies. For example, Royal African Company. It says here it shipped more African slaves to the Americas than any other institution in the history of the Atlantic slave trade. But if you go to the name of what it was formerly called, Company of Royal Adventurers Trading to Africa. Trading to Africa. To Africa. Keep in mind the uniform, that's important. But the name is not a typo, it said it more than once. Right here, Company of Royal Adventurers Trading into Africa. Trading into Africa. They really put emphasis on it this time. Into Africa. Here's another one. African Company of Merchants. The African Company of Merchants or Company of Merchants trading to Africa. Trading to Africa. To Africa. I want that to get stuck in your head. History.com also states, surrounded by Powhatan's warriors and trapped inside the fort, the settlers eventually ran out of food and were forced to eat whatever they could find. Horses, dog, rats, snakes, leather shoes, and according to forensic evidence, even each other. Yes, cannibalism. I wasn't taught none of that history in school. Now, do these sound like people that taught slaves how to grow and harvest crops? You can look this up yourself. Now, the reason they were surrounded by Powhatan warriors and sometimes attacked was because, get this, the English were encroaching on too much land and the Indians didn't like it. Go figure. In the spring of 1610, just as the remaining colonists were set to abandon Jamestown, two ships arrived bearing at least 150 new settlers, a cash of supply, and a new English governor of the colony. On the arrival at Jamestown, they found the Virginia colony almost destroyed by famine and disease during what has become known as the Starving Time. 
Very few supplies from the third supply had arrived because the same hurricane that caught the sea venture badly affected the rest of the fleet. Only 60 settlers remained alive. It was only through the arrival of the two small ships from Bermuda and the arrival of another relief fleet commanded by Lord Delaware on June 10, 1610, that the abandonment of Jamestown was avoided and the colony survived. After finally settling in, Rolfe began his long delayed work with tobacco. Under the command of Sir Thomas Gates and Gates' second in command, Sir Thomas Dill, took firm charge of the colony and issued a system of new laws that, among other things, strictly controlled the interactions between settlers and Algonquians. They took a hard line with Powhatan and launched raids against Algonquian villages, killing residents and burning houses and crops. Burning houses, not teepees. The English began to build other forts and settlements up and down the James River, and by the fall of 1611 had managed to harvest a decent crop of corn themselves. They had also learned other valuable techniques from the Algalquins, including how to insulate their dwellings against the weather using tree bark, and expanded Jamestown into a new town to the east of the original fort. Hmm, who taught who? Thanks largely to John Rolfe, Pocahontas' husband, introduction to a new type of tobacco grown from seeds he smuggled from the West Indies, Jamestown economy began to thrive. The reason for the smuggle was because the Spaniard had laws in place that anyone selling seeds to non-Spaniards is punishable by death. Center paragraph. As the consumption of tobacco had increased, the balance of trade between England and Spain began to be seriously affected. Rolfe was one of a number of businessmen who saw the opportunity to undercut Spanish imports by growing tobacco in England's new colony in Virginia. He had somehow obtained seeds to take with him from a special popular strain, then being grown in Trinidad, South America, even though Spain had declared penalty of death to anyone selling such seeds to a non-Spaniard. They were serious about that tobacco. Fast forward to 1680s, where slavery started taking root. Basically, the English needed more land for cultivation and started taking it by force and the Indians captured were either killed or became slaves, prisoners of war, not Africans, and not the fake Indians they tricked us to believe which were most likely Mongolian squatters, like today's homeless people in tents. That's why they had to hire Italian actors to play Indians in movies. In fact, what African slave after receiving their freedom owned hundreds of acres of land with money from free labor? Guess they use freedom books. His story is a lie for unfinished land grab. You can't even find evidence of any slave ships. They were all warships with captives, which included some Africans. Look, warships. These are soldiers. The most common forms of slavery were those of prisoners of war. Slavery was hereditary, the slaves being prisoners of war. Slavery in New France was practiced by some of the indigenous populations, which enslaved outsiders as captives in warfare. But it was European colonization that made commercial chattel slavery become common in New France. New France was the territory falsely owned by Napoleon. By 1750, two-thirds of the enslaved peoples in New France were indigenous. And by 1843, most enslaved people were black. The institution which endured for almost two centuries affected thousands of men, women, and children descended from indigenous and African peoples. It also impacted many indigenous people who were used as domestic servants and traded as goods. And it wasn't packed to the hilt ships either. It was a moderate cycle of slaves. Now smaller private ships was most likely doing illegal slave trade on the black market. Hey, black market, I get it. Wow, I just blew my own mind. Ha! In 1607, England established Jamestown as its first permanent colony on the North American continent. Tobacco became the chief commodity crop of the colony, due to the efforts of John Rolfe in 1611. Once it became clear that tobacco was going to drive the Jamestown economy, more workers were needed for the labor-intensive crop. The British aristocracy also needed to find a labor force to work on a sugar plantation in the Americas. The major source were indentured servers from Britain, Native Americans, and West Africans. During this period, Barbados became an English colony in 1624 and the Caribbean's Jamaica in 1655. These and other Caribbean colonies became the center of wealth generated from sugarcane and the focus on the slave trade for the growing English empire. The English entertained two lines of thought simultaneously towards the indigenous Native Americans. Because these people were lighter skinned, they were seen as more European and therefore as candidate for civilization. At the same time, because they were occupying the land desired by the colonial powers, they were from the beginning targets of potential military attack. 
At first, indentured servants was used for labor. These servants provided up to seven years of service in exchange for having their trip to Jamestown paid for by someone in Jamestown. Once the seven years were over, the indentured servants was free to live in Jamestown as regular citizens. However, colonists began to see indentured servants as too costly, in part because the high morality rate meant the force had to be resupplied. You ever wonder why the African slave trade only traveled in a clockwise position? It's because the ocean's currents and winds forced them to travel that direction. Back then, it was impossible for ships with sails to travel from Africa straight to America without passing by the islands of the Caribbeans where most slaves were sold before arriving to America because the demands were so great. Of the enslaved Africans brought to the New World, an estimated 5-7% to ended up in British North America. The vast majority of slaves transported across the Atlantic Ocean were sent to the Caribbean sugar colonies, Brazil, or Spanish America. Throughout the Americas, but especially in the Caribbeans, tropical disease took a large toll on their population and required large numbers of replacement. Many Africans had limited natural immunity to yellow fever and malaria, but malnutrition, poor housing, inadequate clothing allowance, and overwork contribute to a high morality rate. So how did South Carolina become the slave capital of the New World? It's because they were captured Indians, sold into slavery on ships headed back to African slave ports and sold as slaves there. It was an endless slave cycle making money both directions. Now what I'm about to read to you, you need to pay very close attention to every word. By 1808, the first year allowed by the Constitution to federally ban the import slave trade, all states except South Carolina, I want you to remember that, South Carolina, had banned the international buying or selling of slaves. Acting on advice of President Thomas Jefferson, who denounced the international trade as violation of human rights which have been so long continued on the unoffended inhabitants of Africa, in which the morality, the reputation, and the best interests of our country have long been eager to prescribe. In 1807, Congress also banned the international slave trade. However, pay attention now, however, the domestic slave trade continued in the South. Keyword, domestic. Domestic, relating to the running of a home or to family relations existing or occurring inside a particular country, not foreign or international. It brought great wealth to the South, especially to New Orleans, or New Orleans, whichever one's better for you, which became the fourth largest city in the country, also based on the growth of its port. In the antebellum years, more than one million enslaved African Americans, all right, let's break this down. Let's start off with the word enslaved because that's gonna show up again. Enslave, make someone a slave, cause someone to lose their freedom of choice or action. The Africans were already slaves. You can't enslave someone that's already enslaved. And the writer of this makes sure they use the term African Americans, a term that wasn't used back then, to let you know what people were enslaved. And there were one million of them. Going back, more than one million enslaved African Americans were transported from the Upper South to the developing Deep South, mostly in the slave trade. Cotton culture depended on slavery formed the basis of the new wealth in the Deep South. There's a lot of key words in this one that I'm gonna have to emphasize, so listen carefully. The end of the first sentence. Between 1670 and 1715, between 24,000 and 51,000 captive Native Americans were exported from South Carolina. More than the number of Africans imported to the colonies of the future United States during that same period. Know the difference between import and export. Additional enslaved Native Americans were exported from South Carolina to Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. The historian Alan Galley says the trade in Indian slaves was at the center of the English Empire's development in the American South. The trade in Indian slaves was the most important factor affecting the South in the period 1670 to 1715. Intertribal wars to capture slaves destabilized English colonies, Florida, and Louisiana. During the 17th and 18th century, Indian slavery the enslavement of Native Americans by European colonists was common. Many of these Native slaves were exported to the northern colonies and to offshore colonies. Especially the Sugar Islands of the Caribbean. The exact number of Native Americans who were enslaved is unknown because vital statistics and census report were at best infrequent. Historian Alan Galley estimated that from 1670 to 1715, British slave traders sold between 24,000 and 51,000 Native Americans from what is now the southern part of the U.S. 
Andreas Resendez estimated that between 147,000 and 340,000 Native Americans were enslaved in North America excluding Mexico. Even after the Indian slave trade ended in 1750, the enslavement of Native Americans continued in the West and also the southern states mostly through kidnappings. Now look at those numbers between 24,000 and 51,000 Native Americans between 147,000 and 340,000 Native Americans. Now when was the last time you seen any image of Native Americans, the Red Indians that we were taught, in chains or in cotton fields? Slavery of Native Americans was organized in colonial and Mexican California through Francis, France, Francican mission. Ha! <laughs> Theoretically entitled to 10 years of Native labor, but in practice maintaining them in perpetual servitude until their charge was revoked in the mid-1830s following the 1847-48 invasion by U.S. troops. I'm getting tongue-tied right here. The lottery or orphan Indians were de facto enslaved in the new, in the new state from statehood from 1850 to 1867. Slavery required the posting of the bond by the slaveholder and enslavement occurred through raids and a four-month servitude imposed as punishment for Indian vulgarity. In 1720, about 65% of South Carolina's population was enslaved. So what they want us to believe that 65% of South Carolina population was Africans. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of Africans. Who's buying up all these slaves? That's almost two slaves per person. Enslaved people outnumbered free whites in South Carolina from the early 1700s to the Civil War. Yeah, I bet. They were already there. Most of the slaves sold from the upper state were from Maryland, Virginia, and the Carolinas, where changes in agriculture decreased the need for their labor and the demand for slaves. Before 1810, primary destination for slaves who were sold were Kentucky and Tennessee. But after 1810, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas, deep south states, received the most slaves. This is where cotton became king. Kentucky and Tennessee joined the slave exporting states. They were exporting slaves, not importing. Historians estimated nearly one million in total took part in the forced migration of this new middle passage. Why would you have to force slaves to states that already have slaves? My message to the copper colored Americans, you are being more detached from your rightful place on this planet. They're using witchcraft to do it, something they learned from you. The same black magic they call voodoo. They're taking everything that makes you, you. Not only they got our men to go from this to this, and our women to go from this to this. Thank you, Queen. We stand for the black woman. Yep, this is uh, kind of like high protesters, and we're outnumbered. <laughs> yeah. and gave you a white god while they still worship a black god. They took your culture and going as far as to take your creative talents from you. If you haven't noticed, more and more black athletes, actors, and hip hop artists origins are from other countries. Years from now, you, we, us, will be known to the world as useless people that died off, all because our ancestors were tricked. Tell me our people are not under a spell. Wake up. You want to know another word for spell? Hypnotize. Sounds or vibration from your mouth put out in specific order with specific tone combined with images, visual, imaginary that causes a change in thought process. Spells. Natural born common sense which they encourage us not to use is your best defense against any spells. Let's pretend you're in a foreign country and you're watching the news and a lady was talking about a man just came up to her and gave her a thousand dollars. Judging by his looks and accent, she describes the man as an American, about 5'10", bald head with a mustache. Keep that description in mind. Raven Simone caught a lot of heat when she told Oprah she's not African American but an American. And Oprah fat ass didn't help the situation at all with her negative comment telling her she was going to catch a lot of flack for saying it, knowing full well she using brainwashing technique on her viewers. I would play the video but I'm pretty sure that clip would get my video flagged. 
Oprah pretty much saying to all blacks, do not call yourself American without adding the word African or black to it. Words of separation. Now be honest with yourself. When I gave you the description of the man that gave away $1,000, how many of you pictured him to be white? White people don't have to call themselves white American or European American. The census proved they're not even Americans at all. But people assume America means white, just the same as Egypt means white. Have you ever heard of an African calling themselves a black African? Or a Jamaican calling themselves a black Jamaican? No, we just assume. Like the world assume American is synonym for white. And the only reason we all know Egypt is being whitewashed is because we're all seeing it happening. And Egypt is just one of many. This has been happening worldwide. If you think you're ready to have your perception of reality shattered, check out Medicine Man YouTube channel and watch his Claim of Thrones videos. He has years of collected evidence, arts, and portraits of a time where all royalty was black. He even gives you timelines of wars, when countries' names were changed, and the language they were speaking. You could tell he put a lot of time in these videos. You would be in for a shock to see the things he's collected. I believe Raven was covertly trying to wake people up. She chose her words carefully and was sure to make it about her, even though she contradicted herself by saying, I don't know where my roots go to, referring to Africa, and right behind it saying, but I know my roots are in Louisiana, double speak if you ask me. I salute you Raven, you're a trooper. You put your career on the line for telling the truth and what you believe, even though you know it goes against the narrative. DNA ancestry is a lie. If you take the time to ask your great grandparents and higher questions about their lives, chances are you will find that you're more closer to finding out that you're from America than you are from Africa. Ask them why you still have a chance because there are very few of them from that era left. After they're gone, then you're lost. I've been around black people all my life. Besides the ones from Africa, I haven't met any that claim they found relatives in Africa. But I did hear a few claim Indian tribes. I'm actively searching for mines right now because we're not from Africa. Most Africans are dark chocolate. Americans are copper color. And once you realize who you are, these history markers will tell you more about what happened to your people than any books in school. As promised, this is where history gets even more stranger from what we've been taught. Some of you may have noticed, but what's off about this picture? Those don't look like teepees we keep seeing in the movies. The person that drew this added those buildings for a reason. So the Indians were living in large buildings, not teepees. Interesting. And this one's my favorite. The most accurate, the article says, right? This is a fort. No slaves built that, but the black Indians here didn't either. Okay, we're gonna use our critical thinking skills. Now we know these are the Spaniards, right? That should tell you before there was a US Army, before there was a United States, before there were European invaders, this fort was already here. Who built it? Who was it intended for? Before reasoning, I knew this fort was older than that generation of Indians right here because it has cannons. The black Indians didn't have weapons that uses gunpowder back then. Then reasoning set in. If people before them built this fort for ship senses on the waters, then that would mean they seen a ship before and able to build ships themselves. They obviously had the skills. This fort may be hundreds of years older than the people themselves, maybe even thousands. I would go as far as saying that it may be as old as the pyramids in Egypt. Who built it? Who or what was it intended for? Here's where it gets good. Most if not all forts off the shoreline are star forts. Star forts always makes me think of one in particular because I was stationed there. Fort Monroe. My best and worst memories are there. I clicked on images for Fort Monroe and this what popped up. This is where I got the history mark idea. See this is how coincidence works for me. Full circle. It's non-stop. It works the same way for you too. You just have to recognize it. I think I remember seeing this. I was stupid then, I just brushed it off. The first documented Africans in Virginia arrived in 1619 when a Dutch warship, notice it says warship, landed here at Point Comfort. The 20 and odd Africans captured from the Spanish were traded to the Virginia colonists in exchange for foodstuffs. Early Africans who lived here included Antony and Isabel and their son William, likely the first black child in present day Hampton. I don't know where they were going with that. They served Point Comfort Commander William Tucker, but whether the early Africans were treated as indentured servants or slave is uncertain. The institution of slavery evolved during the 17th century as the term of service for Africans was extended for life. The U.S. abolished slavery in 1863. This is where the story takes an unexpected turn. For those that don't know, this isn't the only star fort. There are star forts all over the world, hundreds of them, under similar design. I started thinking, what if there was a certain point in history, probably thousands of years ago, the whole planet was on the same page for a common threat? Maybe something from the air. 
maybe something from the ocean, or maybe even giants. I got something to say about giants in a future video. So if they were all on the same page, and a lot of these forts were built in the 1500s, we can assume they were all built in the 1500s. So looking up these forts in the United States that were built by slaves, I found a lot of things that don't add up. History gets far more stranger than you can imagine. Trust me, you're going to want to see part two. If you would like more information on the real American Indian, may I suggest two of my go-to channels, both having years of research under their belts. Dane Calloway has great information about the history of the original inhabitants of America and how to trace your lineage. And a Tonchinous one. Hope I'm saying that right. I love this brother's passion. He put a lot of time in his research. Some of his videos are lengthy but understandable because he dissects the little details that most people overlook. Watching one of his videos will make all the other ones on this subject easy to grasp. And thank you all who support the channel on Patreon. I really appreciate you. Special thanks to Natalie, V. Chapa, and Thomas for being patient and helping me out with my settings because I was having problems. Patreon supporters will have access to part two within an hour. Everybody else next weekend. Thank you for your support and have a great day.